Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank David and Chloe for organizing the session and for, well, allowing me for accepting me and inviting me here. Um, I already presented something on gender, as David has said uh, last year, but this time is more of a theoretical framework, right? Uh, so, okay, my main two questions here are, should we approach an archaeology of gender and gender in Islamic societies, given that it's a very critical <laughs> issue nowadays? And if we should, how can we do it? How can we do it in a way that's deorientalizing and avoids the political issues that are now uh, all across the Western world regarding Islam and women? So first of all, I would like to introduce a bit of like how Muslim women have been long a topic of discussion in the West, and the narrative of Oriental or Eastern women being already subjugated to a patriarchy uh, before the colonial invasion was, uh, was already paired with the civilizing mission of the West in colonial times, uh, both from a colonial perspective and later from the optics of Western feminism, as I will now explain. Uh, so this means that a large part of this discourse relied on images of these other women and their struggle in an oppressive society. These were epitomized in images of the harem, the veil, and later like the, hot, uh, the latter being a hot topic in, in current political discussions. And as, Mah as Mahmoudul Hassan puts it, the demeaning representation of women was put forward in a threefold image, being Oriental, being women, and being Muslim. So even after um, the political decolonization of the uh, Arab world, uh, um, this image has persisted, particularly uh, the image was not censored by me, I must note it was like that on Google. Uh, so uh, particularly from the last decade of the 20th century up to today, a criticism of Islam as a religion has come from the West and the neo-colonialist discourses have often used women and Western feminism as, as weapon. So as Spivak or Chandat al Mohanty analyzed, Western feminism was transformed into a neo-colonial device but by which to homogenize the categories of analysis and further universal ideas of gender, of what a woman is and what a woman seeks. Meanwhile, on the other end, uh, Muslim scholars such as Margot, ba uh, Margot Badran, Asma Barlas, or Kisha Ali have argued for uh, for an Islamic feminism, one that empowers um, one empowers women while not negating their religious experiences, and one one which uses the Quranic precedent and in some cases uh, also the Hadith as guiding principles. In it, there have been different schools of thought and very fruitful debates, often from the fields of law, literature, and religious studies that I cannot fully go into because of time constraints. Uh, but, however, I would like to highlight the, pos the position of Fatima Sedat, who argues not for an Islamic feminism, but for the feminism of an Islam taken for granted. She says that while the feminism, on, feminism of, an Islam, uh, of an Islamic feminism must inevitably locate feminism in a Western intellectual paradigm, the feminism of an Islam taken for granted allows for feminism to be located in an alternate history of reason. It may argue equally for a historically located Muslim gender consciousness, or an androcentric Muslim past. So in this mindset, there is the possibility of recognizing different ways of being uh, and different applications for met uh, feminist methods, while ensuring the value of difference and allowing it for it to endure. So in fact, this mindset is, I consider, vital because uh, studies of gender in past Islamic age societies have been somewhat abundant, yet frequently take an interpretation of Islam as a trans-historical phenomenon uh, or have been looking for past Muslim women. Our first share of studies of history of gender in Islamic age societies have also fixated on the harem, or the eunuchs, or the veil, and the, these grand narratives. And on the other hand, historical studies of gender in Islamic age societies are somewhat frequent, but archaeological and material, to, material approaches to gender not so much. As has been explained, the topic of gender in Islamic age societies is politically loaded. We must consider how can we actually explore gender practices and norms in uh, Islamic societies, and if it's possible to decolonize the image of the gender and of gender in Islamic societies. So for this, first of all, we should consider following the words of Sedat, the archaeology of taking Islam for granted. 
<laughs> that is to resist the definition of what Islam or Muslim is and consider that Islamizations take place over and over, which I don't think it's news for everyone here, but I think it's worth highlighting nonetheless. So second, we must also learn to read gender in everything. As a, tr a structure that informs and is informed by practices, performance and our understandings of group, social, and economic status, sexual behavior, and yes, religion, it is important that we consider the ve uh, very varied material, um, material manifestations that gender may have. So that is, we must go beyond looking for women, uh, although given their general absence in the archaeological discourse, they must be looked for, uh, but we must understand how these systems were configured. For these, we must go beyond the veil, beyond the great narratives, the harems of the Quranic and Hadith precepts of privacy and intimacy, and try to see what is there, what's actually there. Within Islamic societies, women are often regarded as both agents and disruptors of the Islamic orthodoxy. Um, as they are often displaced from public religious acts, and in this case, for example, I'm going to later talk about Al-Andalus, uh, but in, um, in case of uh, some instances of uh, some Muslim countries, sorry, they are discouraged to attend the Friday uh, prayers in the, in the mosque, namely, um, they develop different practices of piety more linked to customary tradition that encourage the creation of regional Islamic identities. This is to say that they have a key role in the intersection of religion, ethnicity, and gender, and in weaving together the un-Islamic, or pre-Islamic, if you want to say, with Islamic expressions of piety and identity, women exert a type of resistance and that affect entire groups in the expression of both their religion and their gender. So for instance, uh, Leila Boulogot studied female mourning in Bedouin groups in Egypt, a practice that has a pre-Islamic origin, and is considered uh, by men a weakness of their faith, but at the same time is an exertion of the Muslim piety, so they do not dare to question it. They just use it uh, on their own way to, and this gender discourses around death, to actually produce and reproduce a hierarchical social order uh, regarding gender, which affect also how the men present themselves. So how can actually uh, practices of masculinities and femininities um, in past Islamic, how can we see them? Studies, uh, oh sorry, actually. <laughs> uh, studies of skeletal remains can give insight into sexed bodies and what kinds of activities, traumas and illnesses they went through. Uh, in Europe, uh, we have, I guess, blood, the we, uh, bone remains are more easily accessible than in uh, Muslim uh, countries that are currently Muslim, of a Muslim majority. Uh, we can also study domestic spaces, of course. Uh, they can also be approached from the optics of gender, particularly as it was understood, uh, we consider that in patriarchal societies it's generally understood as a dominion of the woman. Uh, but it can be used to understand influences of ma masculine space, feminine space, and how privacy or domestic labor were understood. Material culture in general, I think, can also be read on the optics of gender, even when the associations between the material culture and the person behind it are not so evident. And last but not least, we, can also, we should also look into maintenance activities, which are vital for the creation, the identification of the group, but at the same time are, um, are not well understood, are not naturally approached, right? Uh, so an, as an example, I would like to focus more on my area of study, which is al uh, I'm going to present first some examples um, on how uh, gender can be interpreted in, in a, in, through these different fields, right? So first, in al as Jose has already said, there was, an, there was a migration. Um, and there was a migration of whole family groups, which meant that women also came in, women from North Africa also came into the peninsula early on, which means that uh, a series of customs and traditions and uh, practices that are normally carried out by, by one gender were also transmitted. So, for example, in the Magbara of Pamplona, which was studied by Premier, um, well, Prevedo, I don't know how to pronounce her, so I mean, but uh, she, uh, they both carried a theological analysis, and they found out a dozen individuals that had a finding of the teeth, which is a practice that is actually forbidden by some tradition because it's, it was used to enhance the beauty, and that's considered that it should not happen. It's 
a dozen individuals, most of them female. There were some male, but it's understood as a female practice even in, North, in African populations. And the fact is that this practice appears in the peninsula, and the study of haplogroups showed that it also was carried out in some local individuals, but it appeared, it appeared in Pamplona early on, but later on uh, it faded out. And we see other later examples in the 13th century in, in Puerto Alvira. But uh, it, doesn't, it seems that it's a practice that is carried out uh, attached to ethnicity, but it does not survive, uh, at least not in a great extent. We'll see with more results, I guess. Um, I would also like to focus, as an example of bringing gender in material culture, on a particular piece of kitchenware um, and the space that it's associated with, the anafe or anafre. The anafe is a type of portable stove that appears in the Iberian Peninsula after the conquest. Although not as, an, not as an immediate development, it had a chamber at its base where the charcoal would be placed and an upper, um, an upper compartment where the, the, um, where the cooking would be taking place, right? <coughs> so its uh, function, um, sorry, would be as a kitchen, uh, uh, as a kitchen where, as a cooking where, sorry. Um, so some of these pieces have handles for better transportation and in the urban center of Bayana, or patina, during the 10th century, this type appears on the second level, and it seems to be frequent in urban households uh, from then onwards. And this appearance also kind of questions the appearance of, like the identification of a particular spot as a kitchen, right? So um, even in the suburban expansion of Cordoba during the Caliphate, no room in the ones that were uncovered seems to actually operate as, a, as just the kitchen, but it seems there seems to be a dialectic um, of the masculine versus the feminine influxes of uh, what a space can be uh, used as. So I, un I understand this, that this involves a greater dialogue between yeah, the masculine and feminine influxes in the family group because the, the one of the main core acti maintenance activities, that is preparing food, would be able to take place in different areas around the house. We see this continuing in other sites in the Mudejar neighborhoods of Toledo. Uh, but later on, in later examples with the arrival of the Amohats and the greater influx of North African traditions in the peninsula, the anafe seems to change into a complementary element to a fixed structure, as indicated in one cooking treaty of the 13th century. So its, its function would be to keep already elaborated dishes warm or to prepare certain, certain sauces. And we see this in Cieza, uh, in or in Siasa. Um, I took these two houses as more because I think this map of Navarra Palazón is very good, but it, in the, uh, doesn't show well. So it supposedly he, uh, he made a structure, uh, a division of the houses by importance and, and size, and even the smaller houses, uh, instead of having a main hall in the, lo in the lower ground, they have a kitchen. So it seems that uh, this, along with the smaller, um, with the smaller um, uh, anaphy that we have then, uh, some of them um, glaze and everything, we see that the anafe is transformed from a, from a piece of kitchenware or cookingware to a piece of tableware. This means that the practices of cooking and feeding the family are transformed and are actually now fixated to a, a particular room. Actually, in Siasa, we see that uh, we see some pinajeras um, in the larger in the larger households in the kitchen, but in, even in the smaller households, we see like a fixed structure that would actually sclerotize the understanding of space within the household. This goes along with tendencies in the Almohad period yeah, with a great, for a greater definition of spaces. And in, redef in this redefinition, um, this would, uh, <clears throat> sorry, this implicates that female practices, although still important, might be sclerotized and uh, fixated to a less visible area of the household. Um, so the anafe also, I must say, did survive into the modern era, and it is attested until the, at least the 16th century with some 17th century examples, not particularly in art. So this is uh, Velázquez's painting of an old lady frying eggs, and this is an anafe, as you can see. Uh, so it went beyond an ethnic or religious use, of course, but we... Um, a long transcended, yeah, a religious tradition, however, how it was used and the implications that this had on gender performances did change 
probably associated to socioethnic transformations with the changes brought by greater influxes of North African populations. Uh, this is more to posit the question, actually. Um, so in conclusion, opening our eyes to reading gender in everything is a key aspect of understanding how ethnicity and socioeconomic position inform gender as much as religion does. By taking Islam for granted and reading it as historically contingent and historically and geographically contingent, we may speak about how men and women in Islamic gay societies uh, are, operate through the optics of uh, transversal optics of gender, socioeconomic status, of course, sexual or, or sexual position. My aim here was to introduce how this is not only important, but I think also it can be done and it's necessary for the orientalizing this image of gender in Islam. Uh, I also must say, I said we must go beyond looking for women, and I talked only about women, but like, it's only as an introduction because generally they have not been looked for, so yeah, that's my conclusion. Thanks for listening.